All right, this is a review of fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics just applies two pretty simple physics concepts, conservation of mass and conservation of energy. So with that, let's get into it. The first thing to look at is volumetric flow rate. So here's a pipe. It's got water flowing through it. It has a cross-sectional area of A. And there's not gonna be any fixed length of the pipe. So we define the length of the pipe as V delta T. So V is the speed of the water in the pipe, and then delta T is just some time frame. So the distance that it goes um, through, delta X in some time frame, is V delta T. That's from kinematics. We're going to assume that the water velocity is constant. So that's the kinematics formula when you have constant velocity. And then in some time, delta T, the volume that it carves out is going to be basically a cylinder. So if we say this is a cylindrical pipe, cross-sectional area of A this little part of the cylinder will have a length of V delta T and a cross-sectional area of A. And the volume of cylinders is cross-sectional area times length. So there's the volume. The volume of the cylinder is the cross-sectional area A times V delta T. Now that's the volume. We're looking for volumetric flow rate. So to get volumetric flow rate, we just divide by T. And there's the volumetric flow rate, V over T. It's also sometimes just written as V prime. And it's equal to cross-sectional area times velocity. So the thing about volumetric flow rate in a pipe is it's constant. It doesn't matter what happens to the shape of the pipe, the volume of water coming through the pipe at any given time is constant. And that's because the mass is conserved. So in a certain time delta t, I'm going to have at part A, so on the left side of the pipe, I would have the water go through a volume of a brown there, which is kind of a short length. But at point two here, because the pipe is thinner, it's gonna to have to cover more length in a given time in order for the mass flow rate to be the same. So at point two here, I would have water flow through a volume like that. And at points one and two, I'd have the same mass flow rate. So that'd be M prime, and those would be equal. So I have M one prime equals M two prime. And then the mass of the water, that's gonna be the density of the water rho times the volume flow rate at both points. And then both cases is water. So on the left and the right, I have water. So the density of water cancels out. And I have the, the volume flow rate at one equals the volume flow rate at two. And we just got that the volume flow rate is cross-section area times velocity. So A1 V1 equals A2 V2. And that equation there, that's called the continuity equation, which says the cross-sectional area times the velocity is constant in a pipe. And that's because of conservation of mass. Here's a very inspirational demo of continuity. So you see the cone of water is slow, jet of water is fast. An important application of continuity is Pascal's principle. So this is a case where you're gonna have two pistons and some fluid between them. And often it's compressed air. So in this case, we have compressed air between these two pistons to lift a car. At piston one here, you're pressing air down. And at piston two, you're pressing air up. And the thing about it is you're pressing a certain mass of air down at piston one and a certain mass of air up at piston two. Due to conservation of mass, that amount of air has to be the same at both piston one and two. And then we also have that energy is conserved as well because you're um, putting force on piston one, which is gonna have work being done on piston one. That's gonna equal the work being done on piston two. So in both cases, you're moving air a distance of D1 at piston one and D2 at piston two, and you're applying different forces. You're applying a smaller force at piston one than at piston two. That's why you use these this is in order to apply a small force to create a big force. Okay, um, so what I have right there, F1 D1 equals F2 D2. That's just basically conservation of energy. Um, so I'm doing work at one. So at, at piston one, work is being done on the piston, and then piston two is basically doing work on the car, and that's because we do work here to press this piston down. That does work to press this piston up. There's no non-conservative forces here, so energy is conserved. So the work done on the left equals the work done on the right. So you have basically the works being the same, which means that the force times the distance is the same for both the left and the right pistons. So there's the area of the two pistons, A1 and A2. And because of continuity, you're pushing down a certain mass and therefore volume of air at piston one. So you're pushing up that same volume of air at piston two. And the volume would be that distance times the cross-sectional area. So the volumes of each piston are equal. Okay, so that's the second equation. This basically says the volume 
push down at one equals the volume push down at two. So A1, D1 equals A2, D2. And then we have two equations that we want to combine to get eventually Pascal's principle. So that's the second equation solved for D1. So D1 equals A2 over A1 times D2. And then I can take this whole expression and sub it in for D1 in the first equation. And then I get that right there. Now, with the expression I have now, I have D2 on both sides, so I can cancel out D2. And the distances cancel. And what I'm left with is Pascal's principle. And here's what we're left with at the end. So I have F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. Of course, we know force over area, that's pressure. So the pressure at 1 equals the pressure at 2. And that right there is Pascal's principle. Continuity was conservation of mass applied to fluid mechanics. Uh, the thing called Bernoulli's law, that's conservation of energy applied to fluid mechanics. And what we have is a pipe with two sections, part one and part two. Part one is bigger and lower. Part two is smaller and higher. And as it goes for part one, part two, there's pressure on either side of the pipe. So pressure implies there's a force, so there's work being done on both sides. And there's a change in energy. So it goes from one to two, it's going to increase potential energy because part two is going to be higher. It's also going to increase kinetic energy because part two is smaller, so it's going faster. So you have work being done and you have a change in energy. So we're going to use conservation of energy here. So here we have a form of conservation of energy, which says the net work done by conservative forces, because only conservative forces here, is delta U plus delta K, the change in potential energy from uh, one to two and the change in kinetic energy from one to two. So let's start off and look at the network being done in this system. So on both sides of the pipe, there are pressures. There's pressure at one, pressure on two, because basically you have forces going in on both sides. Now there's F1 and F2. And again, those are, those are forces. To find work, you have force times distance. So again, taking a certain snapshot in time, it's going to go through a distance delta x on both sides. On the left side, Again, because mass flow rate is constant, it's going to be a smaller delta x on the right side in order to have constant mass flow rate. And then there's the work done on the left. So the work done on the left at point one is F1 delta x. It's positive because on the left you have a force going in on the system. If we say the pipe um, water is flowing from left to right, that force on the outside is going to be a positive force. So the work is positive, F delta x1. And then pressure is force over area. So force is pressure times area. So that's our work, pressure times area times delta x. Now I'm going to kind of regroup that. So I have area times length, cross-sectional area times length. So that's going to be the volume of this little cylinder. So the total work is going to be PV. So there's the work on the left. It's P1 times V. I'm not going to denote V with a subscript there because the volume of this cylinder on the left is the same as the cylinder on the right. So it's a constant volume flow rate. So we're not going to have V1, we're just going to have volume for the water. Now let's look at the right side. Um, very much the same stuff, except for here. Again, water is flowing from left to right. The outside pressure, so the outside force on the right side is going to be inwards. So that's going to be a negative work. But otherwise, it's the same. So there's the work done on the right side. Everything's the same, except for it's negative. Uh, again, still the same volume. So we have negative P2V for the work done in section two of the pipe. Now for the network, you just add up the work from the left and the right side. So it's P1V, the positive work, minus P2V, the negative work. Now let's look at the change in potential and kinetic energy. So whenever you're doing change in energy, you always do final minus initial. So to find the potential energy, we have the potential energy at point two minus the potential energy at point one. So it's going to gain potential energy. So it's going to be MGY2, which is potential energy MGH, minus MGY1, final minus initial. Same thing for kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So we're going to do final minus initial to find the change in kinetic energy. And there's the change in kinetic energy. Now we can kind of bring all these back to the original expression for conservation of energy and plug everything in. So there we go. We have the network P1V minus P2V equals the change in potential, MGY2 minus MGY1, plus the change in kinetic, one half mv v, one half mv2 squared minus one half mv1 squared. And now I'm going to get all the ones and twos on the same side. So I'm going to bring mgy1 over here and 1fmv1 squared here. 
and bring T2V to the right side. And we're left with that. Um, I'm gonna do one more thing here because we're dealing with, you know, water, not necessarily a certain quantity of water if you're looking at, you know, the left and right end of the pipe. So what we're gonna do here to make it a bit simpler is divide the entire equation by volume. So I'm gonna divide each term here by volume. So here volume would cancel. Here I have M over V, M over V. Here volume cancels. Here I have M over V, M over V. So M over V for any fluid, that's the density of the fluid. Usually it's water, which is a thousand. So when you divide out V, you're gonna get the final expression for Bernoulli's law. And that's the final expression for Bernoulli's law. So this is to compare several things about a pipe. Um, we're not a pipe anywhere. We have water flowing or any fluid flowing. Uh, so you have two points. You're comparing the pressure, the velocity, and the height of those two points. So you have P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus rho G Y1 equals P2 plus one half rho V2 squared plus rho G Y2. And that's Bernoulli's law. Um, you don't have to really memorize that derivation for AP physics. However, you should be familiar with it, kind of know all the steps, not memorize the steps, but kind of know what we did and understand what's going on and understand basically when you have a pipe, what's changing the different parts of the pipe. So how changing the cross-sectional area will change the pressure, how changing the height will change the pressure. You should know how all those variables are related and how they're related in terms of work being done and conservation of energy. And that is Bernoulli's Law. Here's a sample question that looks at a pretty important relationship in fluid dynamics in AP physics, which is pressure versus velocity. So this question just says, how do the pressures at points A and B compare? Well, first we'll look at the velocities at point A and B. So using continuity, um, since the mass flow rate is the same at points A and B, um, A is going to have to have a bigger velocity in order to have the same mass flow rate as at point B. Here's the Bernoulli's equation for this situation. Now for points A and B, they both have the same height. There's no height difference there. So we can cancel that out. And then we just have that pressure A plus one half rho V A squared equals pressure B plus one half rho V B squared. So if A has the bigger velocity, that means that B is gonna have bigger pressure. And that's the final answer. So B has a bigger pressure. Something to remember in fluid dynamics for AP physics that's gonna be really, really, really important is that if you have a higher velocity in a pipe, you're gonna have a lower pressure. What you think about it does make a lot of sense. We'll look at an application right now, which is in um, lift for airplanes. So here's an airplane wing and basically the left end of the wings be the front of the wing. So if you have air coming at the wing like this, uh, we're not getting into how airplane wings are designed, but it's designed in such a way that the air on top is gonna be faster than the air at the bottom. Okay, so we have air going over the top of the wing, fashion the air at the bottom of the wing. And we said that basically in a fluid, speed and pressure are inversely proportional. So that's gonna make the top of the wing have low pressure, the bottom of the wing have high pressure. This is kind of like with something in water, how the bottom of the object has higher pressure, which is gonna cause a buoyant force. So this again is gonna cause a buoyant force. So here I have a higher pressure, which means I have a higher force hitting the, the wing. Here I have a lower pressure, so there's a smaller force. And that's gonna create a, a net upward force, which is a buoyant force. In airplanes, that buoyant force is called lift. Here's a pretty typical Bernoulli's Law question. So we have water flowing through a pipe. At point A, the water moves at a speed of 10 meters per second. Um, the radius at point A is 0.2 meters. At point B, the water drops to a lower height, two meters lower, and tapers down to a radius of 0.1 meters. Find the pressure at A if B is open to the outside. So before we start, B being open to the outside means that at point B, your atmospheric pressure. Anytime a pipe, or anytime water, a fluid is open to the outside air, it's an atmospheric pressure. Okay, so before we go into Bernoulli's Law, the first thing we have to do before we do that is find the velocity at B, because you're having the velocity at A, but not at B. So we're gonna apply the continuity equation which says the area at A times the velocity at A equals the area at B times the velocity at B. And these are both circular pipes. We're told they're circular pipes. So the area is pi R squared. And of course the pi's cancel out. So that's the expression for the velocity at B. And then we just plug in numbers. And I mean, you don't need a calculator here. It's 0.2 squared over 0.1 squared. So you're gonna get 40. So the velocity at B there is 40 meters per second. And now having that velocity, we can go in and use Bernoulli's law.
All right, now there's Bernoulli's law. Um, we can cancel out the height at B. So I can define B, I can say that's height equals zero. So I can go ahead and cross that out. Um, nothing else cancels out, but I do know everything. This is what I'm solving for, PA, I don't know that. We know the velocity at A. We know the height at A, it's two. B's atmospheric pressure, which we know, it's 1.01 times 10 to the fifth. And we know the velocity at B. So everything there is known except for what we're looking for, which is A, so we're good to go. And that's the expression when you solve it for the pressure at A. I group the velocities here. And then you plug in numbers. It's a lot of number crunching, but it's pretty easy. And you that you get the pressure at A. So the pressure at A is 8.31 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. And there you go. All right, so Torcelli was another Italian guy. And he looked at how water, how fast water comes out of a container if you have a hole in the container, if it's full to a certain height. Now, so here I'm sort of making an assumption here that's going to be pretty important. So this is a tank filled with water to a height of H. And there's a hole that is a distance of Y above the bottom of the container. And this is really important. We're going to assume that changes in the water level are negligible. And we'll get to that in a minute. So we're trying to find out how fast water leaves this hole here. It's going to leave horizontally, which is its own thing. You can do projectile questions with this, which we're not going to go into on this. Um, so at point one, there's the pressure at point one here. And then point two was where it leaves. So here's the pressure at point two. It's going to leave the speed at point two of V2. And we'll go ahead and apply Bernoulli's law to find out what V2 is. So P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus rho gh, that's the height at point one, equals p2 plus one half rho v2 squared plus rho gy, that's the height at point um, two. And then we just have that assumption there, assume changes in the water level are negligible. That means that the speed up here at point one is zero, so we can cross that out. There's no change in the water level, so there's no velocity at point one because the water is not moving down there. And then we can cross out something else as well. We can cross out P1 and P2. And that's because they're equal. P1 and P2, both these points here, P1 and P2, are open to the atmosphere. So that means they're both atmospheric pressure. So if I have atmospheric pressure on both sides of the equation, atmospheric pressure is going to cancel out. So now I'm left with rho gh equals 1 half rho v2 squared plus rho gy and the rows cancel out. And I get the speed at point two, the speed that's gonna leave the container is gonna be the square root of two G H minus Y, which in general for Torricelli's theorem, if you have a hole in the container, the water level is not changing, the speed would be the square root of two G delta H, where delta H is just the change in the height. Now this is only true if the top of the container is open to the atmosphere, so keep that in mind if you're using this theorem. This is only if the top of the container is open to the atmosphere. And some other things about Torricelli's theorem to know about, um, the deeper the hole is, so like the bigger the water has to fall, the faster it's going to leave the container, which is pretty obvious. And then something the exam likes to talk about is, you know, for the horizontal range, this range delta x, when is that maximized? Well, yes, the deeper the hole is, the faster the water is going to be, but also the less time it's in the air. So it's going to have its maximum range exactly halfway to the top of the water level. And that's Torricelli's theorem. And that is it for fluid dynamics.